Shia Rabba. Indeed, those who have faith and do righteous deeds, it is they who are the best of creatures. The reward near their Lord is the Garden of Eden, with streams running in them to remain in them forever. Allah is pleased with them, and they are pleased with Him. That is for those who fear their Lord. Jami'an salamun alaykum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of your great a'mal, azadari, commemoration, and mourning for Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu wa salam in the month of Muharram and inshallah in the month of Safar. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this majalis from us and give us the tawfiq to actually participate in the ziyarat of Imam al Hussein. Let's recite a salawat together. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Let's not forget about all the marhumin and marhumat, the deceased one, and inshallah we can include them in the rewards of any good thing that we do by reciting a third salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And most important of all, let's express our deepest and most sincere condolences to the heart of Imam of Time, Hazrat Sahib al Asr wa Zaman al Jalallah ta'ala farajahu sharif, by your loudest of salawats. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So alhamdulillah we started a, a two-day discussion here at the community of Al-Bashir and what a great honor and privilege to be invited at this community. Alhamdulillah it seems like a, a good amount of young individuals who are actually thirsty to learn and inshallah put to practice the, uh, the footstep and the way of life of the Ahlul Bayt. So we had started with this topic that number one, when it comes to that visioning that we have, to that perspective, that ultimate goal, that you know, final destination of a Muslim, of a believer, of a mu'min, what's the difference in terms of an Islamic approach and perhaps other faith, other religions, or other, uh, let's say, personal perspectives? So we started with this question that you know, if you're to say, for example, everything that we do, including coming to the masjid of Imam al Hussein, it is in a sense of getting us closer to the path of heaven. So, in in a, in a layman term, we come to the masjid of Imam al Hussein because Imam al Hussein has the power to rescue us. He has the power to get us to the heaven. So, we, I made it challenging. I said, then, what's the difference between us and the Christianity? Because they have the exact idea about Jesus Christ or Nabi Isa, and where they say, you know, he sacrificed himself not only for himself but for the sake of humanity. So whoever has the love of Nabi Isa will gain prosperity. So in actions, when we look at their life, we see that they do not have any sense of rituals except once a week they go to church and they attend, you know, a sermon. They attend like, like you know. Uh, like a once a week, let's say, ritual, and that's for some of them. So if we take on the same approach and we say we come, for example, to the majlis of Imam al Hussein in order to go to heaven, in order to gain prosperity, in order for our sins to be forgiven, then we are no different than you know, our fellow Christians. So why do we claim to have the most completed uh, religion, the most completed pack of life? Because the meaning of religion is a complete pack of living. When we say we have the most completed pack, that means we have the most completed teachings in which it will guarantee and give us the insurance of, ha of having a perfect life in this world and the next. So if that's the case, we have to work on the visioning. We have to work on, on this perspective that we have. We have to work on and see whether we have our priorities in orders. We have to see whether we are actually seeing this truly and, and thoroughly in a way to be able to actually, actually take, you know, uh, like a more firm steps towards the goal that we have. So as I mentioned by the hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wa salam, he says that, you know, the value of every soul, the value of every nafs is no less than heaven itself. Meaning the bare minimum amount of a, of a worthy thing that we can do an exchange with our own selves is heaven. The very, very bare minimum. We're not talking about the maximum. The maximum, as they say, the sky is the limit. 
but the very bare minimum that we have to do the exchange or we should become content and, and consent with doing the exchange is the heaven. So in a way, we're not only coming to the majlis of Imam al-Hussein for the heaven, but we're coming in the majlis of Imam al-Hussein for more. We do the rituals for way more and beyond the heaven. The heaven, we can say it's a bare minimum. So if the perspective is to move on and go higher than heaven, then how should we see the realities? And how can we apply those realities within our personal life? That was a discussion that we started yesterday. And also we tried to talk about this, 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 the second hadith, which was telling us that every mu'min, every mu'mina must try to remove his or her heart from this dunya before their body is removed from the dunya. Meaning as long as we are living, as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us this life, this, this blessing of being alive and living in this dunya, we have to make sure we detach our hearts from the mundane world before they remove our body and little by little gradually our hearts become detached from this world. We may ask why? Because it's going to happen eventually, so why would I want to like, no, do it in advance? The answer to that is because again, the maximum has no limit. It's an infinite amount of bounties and you can say rewards. But the key to it is the detachment from the mundane desires and you know, especially like, you know, the, uh, the personal, we can say, basic needs and desires that we may have. So that is why the ahadith tells us that it is upon every Muslim, every mu'min and mu'mina to remove their heart from this world before their bodies is about to get removed from this world. And then the next thing we talked was the matter of perseverance and how to continue, maintain the path. I gave you the example of Shabbat ibn uh, Rabi' who constantly changed sides you know, starting from time of Amir al-Mu'mineen all the way to the time of Mukhtar al-Saqafi. So once he was on the side of Amir al-Mu'mineen on the, on the battle of Safin, then he joined the Khawarij in the battle of Nahrawan, then Imam, uh, Imam Ali gave a sermon before the battle, he changed side again, but at the time of Imam al-Hassan al-Mushtaba, he joined you know, basically the military of Muawiyah and then continuing on at the time of Imam al Hussein, he was one of the ones who wrote a letter to Abu Abdullah inviting him to Kufa. But by the time Ibn Ziyad reached Kufa, he again changed sides and he started pushing people away from uh, Muslim Ibn Aqil. Not only that, he joined the army of Ibn Ziyad and he was one of the commanders of Ibn Ziyad on the day of Ashura attacking against Imam al Hussein and his army. Then he continues further. Like first he tries to join Mukhtar in his uprising, but then again he changes sides and he, he does a rebellion against Mukhtar and he helps in Sa'id ibn Musayyib, the one who actually kills Mukhtar, you know, to like, give him a plan or provide him information about, you know, how to defeat Mukhtar. So one person, let's say 60 to 70 years worth of lifespan, but constant change of sides. So where the problem comes, he has not recognized what is the truth and what is the battle. Therefore, with every wind and every, let's say, you know, uh, glamorous things that he sees, easily he changes size and he goes to the opponent. In a way, he's just going after the power. Whoever has the most amount of people, whoever has the most amount of power, whoever has the most amount of, let's say, horsemen and like infantry and, you know, the army people, he will be on their side. Just making sure that he will end up on the, vic on, on, on the side that is going to have the typical or Zahiri victory. So we talked about this and we said this should not be the way that we do our analysis. This is not should be the way that we do our cons and pros when it comes to making those decisions in our lifetime. Last but not least, the, the point I was mentioning, it is the fact that the very same point that we are having discussion on, it is constantly and, and like you know, numerously mentioned by the Holy Quran, in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala always raises this question in a form of a, of a in a form of, of a wonder, that how is it possible for people who believe in the topic of hereafter, in the topic of akhira, in the topic of everlasting of, of hereafter, for the very same people to choose the dunya, so they know akhira is eternal. They know Akhirah is going to last forever. At the same time, when it comes to matter of making decision between the dunya and Akhirah, they tend to settle down for something that is temporary and not even an instant. Because, you know, 
how if you look back, let's say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the bounty of life, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, all the way 60, 70 years. When we look back, how many seconds has it passed for all of these years that we have been alive? How many more seconds will it pass for us to continue to be alive? So it's not even, I mean, we can argue that it's not even an instant pleasure, but it's rather mostly what we assume as the pleasure. So Allah keeps on like making this question that how is it possible for those who believe in the topic of hereafter, yet again choose to go for the dunyavi matters, choose to go for the material stuff. One point of it, or one answer to that, that why we keep on falling on the same path and we tend to fall down for the dunya was the fact that every single one of us, we need this thing called wa'iz. And wa'iz has two, two, I mean, it has two, uh, two categories or it has two kinds. Wa'iz means like a teacher. We said he has an external one and we have an internal one. And the most important one is not actually the external one. It is the internal one. Why? I gave you the hadith by Imam al-Baghir alayhi salatu was salam. That he said, مَنْ لَمْ يَجْعَلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ مِنْ نَفْسِهِ وَاعِذَا فَإِنَّ مَوَاعِذَ النَّاسِ لَنْ تُغْنِي عَنْهُ شَيْئَ If somebody does not have this wise, does not have this uh, teacher from within, فَإِنَّ مَوَاعِذَ النَّاسِ لَنْ تُغْنِي عَنْهُ شَيْئَ No matter who gives the, you know, the teaching, no matter who gives the lecture, who, who, matter, like, who gives the sermon, would not have any benefit to him. And the great example of this one, again, on the day of Ashura, when someone such as Imam al Hussein is giving the khutbah, he's talking to them directly face to face. He actually brings up the letters that they have signed, and he makes the point, he makes a reference point. He says, You know, ask those among you who know me by my name and who know my lineage. Yet again, you know, the, the message, the, the reality doesn't click. As if like they have closed down this internal law is that they all have. What were the internal wise that, as we discussed it yesterday, three things at least. One is the fitrah, the innate nature. And that innate nature, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by default, has given it to everybody. We cannot say, oh, this person doesn't have it, or that person doesn't have it, this person has more of it. No. It has been given to all of us, and we have been all been born with this innate nature, but through the circumstances, through the conditions that one may live, and through the choices that one may actually commit and decide, this inner nature changes. It either becomes blind or finds basira. It either becomes death or starts to hear about the reality. It either you know, loses its, its like, you know, compass towards the Sarat al-Mustaqim or is constantly like, you know, it acts as a someone who's, who's lost and is in a constant change between the different paths. So it's upon us to keep this inner nature that we have, this fitra that we have, sound and secure and make sure that it grows on its natural like you know path and number two was the topic of faith and number three the topic of taqwa and we're supposed to talk about these two topics more inshallah tonight so so far all been reviewed so recite a salawat again <coughs> so the topic of iman and taqwa you may say, oh, these are the simple topics we know. We have to have Iman, we have to have Taqwa. But why? And if you know if it's important, how come we're not striving for it? I mean, the holy book of the Quran. We say it's a book of miracle, it's mu'jiza. Even today, nobody has been able to bring something similar to the Quran. Yes? Correct? At the same time, when we recite, when we start to re read the Surah Al Baqarah, what's the second verse that we recite? We have the Hafiz here. The book of the Quran, there is absolutely no doubt in this book. Absolute certainty. It is a guidance for those who are muttaqin. Meaning the very same book of the Quran can become actually a means of diversion for those who do not have taqwa. Example, again, those who took side against Imam al Hussein. They were Hufaz, they, re they remembered the, the verses of the Quran. Some of them were teachers or, or the students of, of, you know, the companions of Abu Abdullah learning the Quran from them. At the same time, they were killing their own Quran teacher on the day of Ashura. 
So it's not that they do not know the verses. They have memorized it. They can recite it well. They can probably understand the meaning of it in Arabic because it's their mother tongue language. At the same time, they do not get the message of the Quran. They read it well, they do not understand it. They assume they understand it. Why? Because the condition, Hudan lil muttaqin. If this taqwa is not there, not even the Quran itself can help them. There has to be this taqwa, there has to be this sense of God varying in us, there has to be this sense of uh, you know, having or this having this sense of of a, of an important place or a position for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala within our heart. Otherwise, nothing will work. Nothing will get it through us. Not even the words of Imam Al Maasum. Same thing happened at the time of Amir Al Mu'minin when he was on the member of Kufa. So who's like more you know eloquent in terms of speaking than Amir Al Mu'minin? And he's giving the khutbah, he's giving the sermons, he's literally beating on the heads of, of the Kufi people. But in terms of the reaction, there are no reaction. People tend to look around, people tend to like, you know, well, at that time they didn't have cell phone, but I assume they would look down, they would think about their farm, they would think about their horses, they would think about their women and children. Why Amir al-Mu'minin was giving the, you know, the, 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 the sermons, which even today as we read them, as we studied them, they are the most eloquent, you know, sermons of, of the time. So if it's like, you know, if you, if you want to practice even writing something similar to Amir al-Mu'minin at this time, it's literally impossible. And we can put it to a test right now. If somebody wants to challenge, I'll give you the challenge. Let's say you guys all, we all say we are the Shias of Amir al-Mu'minin, correct? Yes? Yes. Now, if somebody asks us, I want you to describe Amir al-Mu'minin in one or two sentences, but in those one or two sentences, do not use any point, no dots. Can we do it? Bismillah. Practice that one. Two sentences, three sentences describing Amir al-Mu'minin, but do not use any dots in that sentence. And you can use your cell phone, you can use the internet, you can use everything you want. So if you can find the answer, you will have a prize from me. But Amir al-Mu'minin himself, at that time, he goes on a member without any studying, without going to classes, without having the notes or anything. Right on the member, he starts giving a complete khutbah. Not a single dot in the words that he chooses in that khutbah. So we have someone like Amir al-Mu'minin giving the speech. And it is, it is coming from that the most purest soul of, of the time, yet again, the people do not understand or do not observe the message. Why that internal you know, facility in which we call it the internal what is the internal teacher, is completely mute, deaf, blind, and completely away from its origin. So we have to call, always make sure that you know, we, we sort of like polish our internal what is. We make sure it is in a good hand how we take our car for an oil change, how we take our car for like a, like a random services, how we go to a doctor for, for like, like a, let's say every six months we go for a complete checkup, we do different like, you know, testing, how we tend to like go back to our teachers and professors and ask them about like, you know, how are we doing in the year so that by the end of the year we would not end up with that, let's say, you know, B plus, we want that A minus or A plus. So we're constantly checking on our education, we're checking on our health, we're checking on our, you know, the positions that we have on our house, on our car, even on our family and children. But at the same time, we tend to forget about the main thing, the one thing that is going to remain forever. And that's our true self. I mean, the body is not going to remain. The positions and like you know, all the stuff that we own is not going to remain. Our name and education is not going to remain. You know, our health is not going to remain. So what is it? What is the reality that we're going to live with forever and think about this forever for everlasting for eternal how much have we invest on that how much have we gone back and had a review on that so that's the topic of iman and taqwa meaning that it is through the faith and piety that one can repolish and like cleans that inter or internal wa is how so they say the very first step is to maintain the wajibat not to go to mustahabbat, not go to the, the mustahabbat, ma'akad, no. Just maintain the wajibat. At the same time, make sure you, like, you know, avoid committing the muharramat. Two steps. One, maintain the wajibat. Number two, avoid muharramat. 
That's it, yes. That will open up the path. Open up the path to what? For these internal wires to be activated. Well, as long as it's activated, you get all of the messages that you need in order to gain that guidance that we all want. In order to continue taking steps on that Sarat al Mustaqim. But every time we fall out, we fall down for, like, you know, let's say a misconduct, or we fall down for committing a sin, what happens as if we put a barrier right over the mouth of this internal wall is. We block it completely. So when it's blocked, no matter what is telling us, no matter what is giving us the warning sign, we still would not understand it. The very same question, I think, was raised maybe here in another community. When we look at the enemies on the day of Ashura, after they finished up with Imam al-Hussein, when the process of looting started, we have so many reports that the enemies of, of Imam al-Hussein, they were crying as they were looting the household of Rasulullah. So they notice that they, what they're doing is wrong. At the same time, they cannot stop it. Why is that? That internal wa'iz is, is completely dead at that moment. So in a sense, they still have the conscience, but the conscience is not able to maintain them from committing that evil act. So they keep on like pushing and pushing and pushing more and more on the path of shaitan and on the path of their desires. So once is taking a nickel, uh, I mean, uh, 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 an, an, an ankle weight right, you know, from, from the leg of one of the, one of the women and he's crying at the same time. So she asks him, like, like why, why are you crying? If, if you want to take the, the jewelry, just take it. Why are you crying while, while you're doing this? If, you're, if you think that it's a bad thing, if you think it's, it's an oppression, if you think it's, if it's a zolm, then don't do it. He turns around and says, you know, if I don't do it, somebody else will come and will take it. Then I will be left with this, uh, let's say, enviness that I could have, you know, this, this piece of jewelry, but I did not, for example, take it. So, in a sense, they have the conscience. The conscience is telling them that what you're doing is wrong. But because they have decided to put a block on it, they have decided to give up the taqwa, they have decided to give up the iman and the faith, they're going with that evil action. So, going back to our topic, we started with the matter of that. Number one, because we are forgetful, we always have to have this uh, sense of remembrance, this sense of, of a review, this sense of a reminder for ourselves. That was number one. And number two, how this reminder is going to have impact on us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجَلَتْ قُلُوبَهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Three, we can say, characters or qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relates to the topic of true mu'mineen. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ The mu'minun indeed, and we have إِنَّمَا means it has more emphasis on, on, the, on the term mu'minun. So indeed, mu'minun are those إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ When the remembrance, when the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned, وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Wajalat, it, it comes from, from a stage of fear. But a fear when, you're, uh, when you have this extra amount of, let's say, respect for something. Meaning something, it is so great for you, has so much of a high status at your presence, that by hearing their name or by relating anything to that specific thing, you start to feel that fear within your heart. Not only fear the heart, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wajalat qulubuhum. As if like their heart starts to shake due to the amount of this fear that they have. But again, this is a positive fear. It's not a negative fear that you will run away. It's a positive fear meaning that it gives them more motivation. It makes them more alive. It makes them more in a stage of seeking and, and being eager to seek more. A lot of times we go to so many communities and we call those communities dead communities. Why? They come here only for Imagine of Imam al Hussein, they socialize, they have their barakat, and everybody goes back the very same way they came in. And that's it. Once a week, as I mentioned, just like the, Christ, uh, just like the Christian fellows. Once a week they meet up, they have anything, that, they have whatever they want to do, and after the majlis, they just continue on their personal life. No advancement, no development, no you know, sense of brotherhood, no caring for one another. It all becomes like a dead community 
And a live community is a community that you know is constantly growing. And this constant growth of a community, number one, shows itself in the sense of a brotherhood. How much the people of within the same community care for one another. That's one of the one of the you know the, the criterions of a, of a live, for example, community. So Allah says, "Innamal mu'minun al-ladina idha adhukir Allah wajilat qulubahum." Number one, wa idha tuliyat alayhim ayatuhu zadathum imana. Not only when they hear the zikr of Allah, their heart, you know, shakes, their heart opens up, their heart, like you know, uh, changes in, in, like you know, in a, in a mass, let's say. Uh, uh, in a mass like amount at the same time when they are given when they are recited when they are reminded of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's more it's not only the verses of the Quran but sometimes we see the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala around us sometimes we see the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within ourselves sometimes we see it within the science sometimes we, th we see it within our life Sometimes we see it within the community. Sometimes we see it when, for example, uh, when we go outside in the nature. So different ways. When this happens, they do not just go and say, wow, mashallah, subhanallah. No, this will increase their faith. Meaning this will give them more determination. Determination to do what? To constantly go back and make sure they are following you know, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly, aiming for that ultimate purpose of religion. And while they're doing this, the only reliance point that they have is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, nothing else. And this topic of tawakkul is something, again, I highly encourage everybody to emphasize and concentrate on. The topic of tawakkul doesn't mean to give up working, of course. If you, if you take it in, in a concept of working. But at the same time, as I do the job, as I'm working, as I'm going through my career, where do I see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this picture? How is my skills related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How are the thoughts that are coming to my mind related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How are the actions that I do are related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we see ourselves something completely separated from Allah, as if like Allah is in one corner of the universe? and we are living in, the, in another corner of the universe? Or no, how are we related to you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If he's closer to, the, to us than even you know, the vein of our necks, so does that mean that he has a physical form, that he finds the spots between the vein of our neck and ourselves? In reality, which part of our body do we point and say, this is us? Because if you point at our body, our body is changing constantly. Every two or three years, they say all of the molecules that we have, it changes completely as if you have a whole new body, correct? So if I point at somebody and say, this is, for example, brother such, this is brother such, two years later, if I make the same claim, technically, is not the very same brother. Yes, it looks like him, but all of the molecules have changed. So if you want to point him in the same direction, I say, this is the very same person I saw two years ago, we can make, you know, we can actually like argue about it. So if that's the case, then how are we related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If that's the case, then how is he, you know, when we say he's, he's alimun, he's khabirun, he's qadirun, all of the attributes that we use for him. Again, one good example. Here we are sitting, alhamdulillah, in the majlis of Imam al Hussein, and everybody's mashallah in, a, in the perfect Islamic attire, alhamdulillah. I always give this example because I use it, I mean, I, I find it myself very beneficial. So as the technology you know, advances, we hear more about the cameras being placed in different parts of the city, on the roads, on the intersection behind the uh, traffic lights. And they're constantly monitoring you know, the traffic, your speed, making sure that nobody you know, goes above the, let's say, whatever speed is the normal, is it what, 60 or 70 on the highways here in Arizona? So it's constant, like, like, like a monitoring over our vehicles. Now, if you take the same concept and if you bring it to our masjid, if you take the same concept and we bring it inside of our car, if you take the same concept and we take it to our home, in masjids we usually come in a, like in a very perfect like manners because it's one hour, two hours, three hours. Alhamdulillah, we do our best. But what if you know the same concept has been taken, has been applied to our home when we are interacting with our own families, when we are interacting with our parents or with our wife and and children? Would it be the same results at the end? 
in a sense that let's say right now you have two or three cameras here but they all focus on the speaker so I would say for a change one night maybe the brother has to turn around these cameras and put the focus on the audience then let's see what will be the difference in terms of how we sit or how we face the qibla how we take on a tasbih how we constantly like start to say alhamdulillah 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 when the camera is focused on our face and let's say even more we say instead of having three cameras we bring in like you know one camera per person so no matter where we sit in the majlis that camera is constantly focusing on us how much of the impact we're going to see in our actions now advance the technology the camera not only catches and records our, our like actions but rather records and reads our intention our niya our thoughts sometimes you see this in in a, in, a, in a games that they show a thought of a person in, in a, like a bubble over their head correct actually in terms of spirituality is very similar concept those some of those who have barzakhi eyes this is what they say it's like when you look at the people you can tell what they're thinking because you can see it above their head so you see one person walking by above his head is a football you see another person walking above his head is a like a tesla car you see another person walking on, on top like no top of his head is asu another person is walking is al-bashir another person is walking is probably i don't know going back to home so the thoughts are there and it's clear we may think that it is hidden to ourselves because I am the only one who's, who's hearing or who's, who's thinking, but a lot of others already know this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one, angels number two, and you know, the Ahlul Bayt and the special people number three. So as if like it's constantly all of this been recorded, but we are not aware of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sattar al that's correct. But you have to use the same concept and we have to apply it in our daily life so when I go home if something happens do I get angry right away or no when I see the camera I tend to control that temper if let's say my child wants something from me and I do not have the patient I had a very long day I walk in the home I just want to go home and have some like food and then just you know have some rest and all of a sudden my three-year-old four-year-old five-year-old kid comes up to me and he or she wants to play do I immediately send them off and say, no, I have, like, you know, I had a very long day, I'm tired, you know, go and play, with, for example, go and watch some movies, or no, the minute that I see that camera, I'm going to say, oh, I've been recorded. But isn't that the reality of this world, that we're constantly being recorded, and we just tend to forget about it? So again, we need to have that reminder for ourselves. So this verse of the Quran tells us, number one, the matter of responsibility has to be constantly on the rising value. Meaning that every day as it goes back, every day as, as we grow, every day as we take, every day that we gain from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the amount of responsibility that we have within the individual aspect of our life and social aspect has to continue to grow. Meaning that we have to mature up, not, not to say, oh, I don't, I'm going to take on less responsibility. That is number one. And number two, you know, the path of perfecting our faith and Iman. We should never settle for whatever Iman that we have, whatever Iman that we've been taught, whatever Iman that we've been raised with. Because that's the Iman that is mixed with the culture. Part of it is true, part of it could be wrong. When, and it comes in percentage. Some may have more, some may have less. But we have to take on the path to make sure we continue learning about the faith and the religion that we have, not only to learn just to hear, but to put it into practice. And by putting it into practice is that how we're going to actually do the tabligh of religion. We're going to be able to do the true propaganda in a, in a positive matter, not in a negative matter of religion. And number three, the topic of tawakkul. This topic of tawakkul is like, you know, so many stories probably you all have heard of those who they start doing it or having a tawakkul when everything else seems to not giving them the proper answer. Let's say if they are diagnosed with a severe type of a sickness, a cancer, or COVID, something, and they reach a stage that the doctors, they tell them, no remedy will cure you. At that time, they're going to start doing a tawakkul. At that time, they're going to reach out to other brothers and sisters, and they're going to ask for a prayer. At that time, we're going to start doing ammal yajib. But that's not the way to go about it. 
rather than from day one, from every step, from every, like, you know, the very first point that we start our day, we have to have the tawakkul. Because even the remedies that we may take, something simple as, as an adult cold, something sim, 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 uh, simple as like an, you know, like a painkiller. If we take it without having a tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it may do its function, but we say that function does not have any barakat. Meaning that, 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 that part, that pill that is giving the function to our body, it comes and you know, technically it cures, let's say, the pain that we have. At the same time, because we do not see the connection between that pain and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that specific act does not give us any benefit in terms of the spiritual growth. You see, from every second, every first minute of our day, we have to have this tawakkul, inshallah. So let me give you one more hadith. If you recite it loud, salawat. <coughs> أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم خرج على أصحابه فقال ارتعوا في رياض الجنة. This hadith is interesting because a lot of times we may ask this question from ourselves that as a Muslim, as a Shia, as a follower of the school of the Ahlul Bayt, what can we do for fun? A lot of stuff that other people are doing and we may not be able to do it because in, within our religion is haram. What is it that a mu'min or a mu'mina actually benefits from? What is it that they will enjoy? Here Rasulullah is telling us and he's telling his companion. He says, Irta'u fi riyadh al-jannah. Irta'u is, for example, when you say, go and have fun. You're absolutely free. Go and enjoy. Right? Fi riyadh al-jannah. Qalu ya Rasulullah wa ma riyadh al-jannah. Rasulullah came and said, Irta'u, go and have fun. Go and enjoy riyadh al-jannah. So the Ashab, the companions ask him, Ma Riyadh al-Jannah? What is this Riyadh al-Jannah? Qal majalis al-Zikr, Ughdu wa ra'wihu wa dhkuru. The majalis of Zikr. These sessions, these gatherings of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So two points. If I go to a majlis and I don't feel excited, I don't feel that sense of calmness and peace at the end of the majlis, then I have to go back and again check on those internal teachers that we have, on that wise. Maybe something is wrong there. Maybe I have done something wrong before I come to the majlis. Maybe I have made one, you know, wrong step, one wrong, like, you know, turn before I came to the majlis. So I always have to have that review, which is why they say it's always good to have a tawbah or istighfar before you actually go to the majlis. So majalis al-dhikr, ughdu wa rabbihu wa dhikru. Go in them, have fun, enjoy, and gain your benefits through the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually they say the only thing, the only bounty that the people of heaven have regret for and want to like, you know, have remorse for is the topic of a sa'ah, like let's say an hour, like a half an hour, a minute, a time. بِهِمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا لَمْ يَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى it's like, you know, let's say one hour in, dun in the dunya that they did not spend it on remembering or remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's hard for us to grasp this because we're living in the dunya. But once we leave the dunya, once we depart from the world, again, if you're part of the mu'mineen and mu'minat, when we look back, we will do the same thing that the other mu'mineen and mu'minat do. And that is to bite our fingers. Wow, I had so much time. Instead of focusing Instead of thinking, instead of contemplating, instead of doing ta'aqqul, huh? I spend it on so many other things. I spend it on so many aimless, purposeless, lahwi or la'ib, you know, matters. So when we go to the next word, that's when we look back and we all will end up in the same results. Now, just to complete the, the argument, when it comes to the matter of following the school of the Ahlul Bayt, I just send one more hadith from Abu Abdullah Hussein, just to give ourselves an idea that just calling ourselves Shia or saying that we are born as the Shia is not going to be enough. One person goes, وَقَالَ رَجْرٌ لِلْحُسَيْنِ بْنِ عَلِي عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ يَبْنَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَنَا مِنْ شِيَعَتِكُمْ One person goes to Abu Abdullah Hussein and he says, يَبْنَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَنَا مِنْ شِيَعَتِكُمْ I am one of your Shias. قال, 
Abu Abdullah tells him, be wary of Allah. Be careful of what you are saying. وَلَا تَدْعِيَنَّ شَيْئًا يَقُولُ اللَّهُ لَكَ كَذَبْتَ Do not say something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell you, you are lying. وَفَجَرْتَ فِي دَعَوَاكِ And like, you know, make you expose your true identity. إِنَّ شِيَعْتَنَا مَنْ سَلِمَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ غِشٍ وَغِلٍ وَدَغَلٍ Three attributes. In Shiatana, indeed, our Shias are the one man salimat qulubahum, the ones that their heart is pured and protected and clean from men kull ghishan wa ghillin wa dagal. From any type of scorn, rancor, or deceits, cheating, and cunning. We have to look into our hearts. How much of this double personality we may have? How much of this cheating ideas we may have? How much of this, let's say, deceitful ideas we may have within our heart? As long as we have even an epsilon amount of these like qualities within our heart, we do not fall within the category of the Shias of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, the very same Imam that we try to cry and mourn for. That is why he and he continues, "Walakin qul ana min muwalikum wa muhabbikum." Don't say you are the Shias. Just say you are. The Mawali and the Muhabbin, those who express their affections, the fans in, in a sense. So we root for them, but perhaps in actions, we cannot maintain to walk the same path of the Ahlul Bayt. All that being said and done, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to be able to continue the path of the Ahlul Bayt. And it's not something impossible. I mean, when you look back in the history of humankind, so many examples even from the sisters. I mean, one woman being like in a situation that perhaps if a lot of us were in that situation, we will completely forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the wife of the Fir'aun, Hazrat Asiya. So think about it, being living in the palace of the Fir'aun, having access to pretty much anything that you want. You know, that luxurious lifestyle that you want, Lamborghini, I don't know, like all of the stuff that we, would, we may wish for. The palace, the servants, the, the trips, the like you know adventures, like the different foods, everything that she wanted was there. Her husband, the most powerful person in Egypt, who was calling himself the Almighty, correct? So the power, the status, the fame, the money, everything was at the tip of her hand. At the same time she decides to be a believer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a point that her own husband starts to torture her and through the torturing you know she he actually kills her but she does not give up on the topic of having faith on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so is it possible yes it is possible to what extent to the extent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the mu'minin and mu'minat the example of a woman named Asiya so very much possible all we have to do, we have to try for it. And we have to constantly try for it. We cannot just do it for one night and say, oh, I cannot do it. For two nights and they say, oh, it's too hard. I cannot wake up in the morning for the Fajr prayer. For three nights and say, oh, today was, you know, we had a late majlis. I couldn't sleep like in time. So let me just do Qadha prayer. No, we have to maintain the path. We have to make sure, you know, as I mentioned, like, you know, on the previous nights, whatever we gain from the majlis of Imam al Hussein, we have to keep it, maintain it and let it grow. Otherwise, it won't be anything left at the end. If we constantly are spending whatever we earn, we will end up with empty-handed. And that's not, inshallah, what we want to do. So tonight, let me talk about a very beautiful, beautiful, yet again, generous member of the Ahlul Bayt, that despite of her young age, she's been able to remove so many of the hawaij and so many of problems and, and, and open up the ties from people's life. They say, and this has actually been reported by one of the servants of her beautiful shrine in Damascus, that as they were about to expand the area of, of her shrine, those who have gone, they know she has a very like small shrine. As they were about to extend the area of, of the, you know, the rooms or the courtyards around her shrine, they were trying to buy the houses on the neighboring of the shrine. And as if you have recalled the history, when they brought the Karaman of the Ahlul Bayt, they made sure they would take him through the neighbor, which most of them were either Jews or Christians. So when they were buying the houses, you know, 
the followers, they were paying up extra money to make sure they would get the consent of the people, you know, the neighboring like people to buy their houses and, you know, ex include them within the shrine of this beautiful lady. They said they start purchasing houses after houses after houses. One house, no matter how much money they offered, they were denying, you know, the rights to sell the house. They were not like give up the house. No matter how much like different people they went to them, they talked to them, they had meetings, again, offering more money. No, this couple were saying, no, we're not going to sell the house. We do not believe in this stuff. We are not going to sell the house. Sometime later, the very same couple, they come back to the shrine of Bibi Rupaya and they offer their house at no cost, free, complete donation. So the servants, you know, they have the question. Not so long ago we came to you, we were constantly asking you for like selling your house to us at this price that was like unbelievable. Yet again, you were not ready for like, you know, making this exchange, what happened? So they started telling their story. They said that, you know, the husband is saying this, like after you guys came and offered, you know, uh, uh, the price on our house and, and we denied your request. A Couple of months later, my wife became pregnant. At first, everything was good until the very last months of, of, of her pregnancy. When, like, you know, as we went to the doctor, the doctor was telling us that her condition is so rare that either the child is going to die or the mother is not going to make it after the childbirth. So the best option is to keep her within the hospital and we keep it under, like, you know, 24 7, like, you know, uh, like, like the, the monitoring system. So we're hoping that we can help her in, 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 in any way to keep, you know, her life or keep her alive. So the husband had no other choice. He submits him to the hospital, and every day he goes back and forth, you know, going to his work and going to hospital, come back home, and continues for some time until to a point that the doctor starts saying that you have to make a decision. We cannot keep both of them, either the child or the mother. And of course, he doesn't want to give up the, give up the child, nor does he want to give up the mother. And he's like, he keeps on asking for extra days to think it over. He said one day it happened to be on the day of Muharram, on the days of Muharram. As I was thinking over my decision, I realized that all of these people are going to the shrine of Lady Ruqayya, groups and groups and groups, and they're doing these rituals that I do not understand. But I noticed that people are donating some stuff and they're asking for their hawaj. So without thinking, I start following them. I entered the shrine. I made this promise to myself that, oh, the person that I do not even know your name, if you go ahead and take care of my wife and my child, I will make sure that I will pay my entire house. I will give up my entire house for you. He said, as I was like, you know, doing this, uh, we can say tawassun to Lady Ruqayya, I started crying unintentionally. I started crying so much that I forgot how much time I have spent on the, on the haram and the shrine of Lady Ruqayya. When I came back to my senses, I realized a couple of hours has passed, so I immediately ran back towards the hospital to make sure I would check up on my wife uh, and, and a child. By the time I got back, they gave me a news of a delivery. So I became even more stressed, so I ran immediately to the room where my wife was kept. When I knocked on the door, when I entered the room, I saw both my wife and my little daughter healthy and secure and sound. So I started asking them, what happened? They asked me, where have you been? I asked them, you know, I had to take care of some of the business. Then my wife immediately told me, did you go to Lady Ruqayya? At that time, I did not know the name. I said, who? She said, Lady Ruqayya, the three-year-old. I was, still didn't know like, who she was referring to. And then she said, as you left, this little child, this little girl came on knocking on the door. She came in, she introduced herself. She said, my name is Ruqayya. I'm a daughter of Hussein, granddaughter of Rasulullah. And don't worry, we will take care of you and your child. And let me give you this piece of information, this news that your child will be a boy. Make sure you name him Hussein. She said this, and as she was about to leave the room, she turned back around again and said, say my salam to your husband. He's been holding on to my zari for some time now. And she left. The minute he heard this, he again went back running and running towards the shrine of Bibi Ruqayya. 
That's when he decided to give up and donate his entire house for the shrine of this three-year-old. Despite of her young age, so many things she's been able to do. As they bring back the caravan of Imam al Hussein, as they bring back the prisoners of Abu Abdullah al Hussein and the progeny of Rasulullah towards the city of Sham, one manzil to the, to the city of Halab, as they rest for the night, they say it happened that they rest on the side of this church of the Christians. So at that night, it happened to be a priest who was a monk and he was constantly spending his days and nights in that church. He looks out of the window and he notices a light that is going from the earth all the way to the sky. He comes out from the church for the first time perhaps in so many time. He starts looking for the, right, for the light and he realizes that light is coming out from a head that has been placed over a spear. He goes closer and he asks the soldiers, who are you guys? They say we are the soldiers of Ibn Ziyad, we are the soldiers of Yazid, and we are the soldiers of the Khalif of the Muslims. He asks them, what is this head on the spear? They tell him this is the head of Hussein. Who is Hussein? Hussein is the son of Ali. Who is Ali? Ali is the cousin of Rasulullah, so he is the grandson of Rasulullah. You mean your messenger? Yes, the grandson of our messenger. What kind of a people are you? If he had a grandson of our messenger, we would place them, we would place them on our eyes, not to put the head on the top of a spear. The soldiers, they, they turn around, they say, you really want the head? How much money you have? The priest thinks a little bit, says, I give you 10,000 ashrafi, 10,000 is all, all I have. Just let me have the head with me for the, for the night. You guys are resting anyway. The soldiers look at each other, 10,000, we can divide it three ways, okay, it's a good deal. They bring down the head of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, they hand it to this Christian monk and they take the money. In the Maqtal has it that he takes the head back to his, his church, he closes the door and he places the head in front of him, he washes it, he cleans it, and as he's looking at him, he says, Oh Allah, by the right, by the haqq of Nabi Isa, make this head talk to me. He sees something, he cannot talk to him. The head of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein looks at him and says, what is it that you want from me? La ilaha illallah. He turns out and says, who are you? He says, Ana al-Husayn ibn Ali. Ana al-Husayn ibn Ali and al-Muhammad and al-Mustafa. I am the one, I am the grandson of Rasulullah. I am the one who was killed in Karbala. I am the Madhloom. Anal Adshan. I am the one who was killed while being thirsty. They say the entire night, this priest, this monk, starts to just enjoy looking at the beloved head of Abu Abdullah al Hussein in a spiritual matter, of course, and constantly praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thinking that how am I going to say my goodbye to this beloved head of a grandson of Rasulullah. They say as the morning approached and the soldiers were about to, you know, continue their path, they knocked on the door to receive the head. Now this priest, realizing that it is the time of farewell, the Maghtal says, he, he placed the side of his face to the face of Imam al Hussein and says, Oh Allah, I will not remove my face, I will not remove the skin of my face from the skin of the grandson of your Rasul Allah, unless if you promise me to give me the Shafa of Abu Abdullah al Hussein in the next. Again, Imam al Hussein comes to words and says, If that's what you wish for, embrace Islam and do your Shahadatain. And he says his Shahadatain, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Aliyan Walhiyullah. But let me give you another farewell in the wreckage of Sham. Why do they call it the wreckage? Why do they call it, you know, the Kharaba? Again, one house next to the Darul Amara, but this time at the time of Muawiyah, they're trying to expand his palace. This house belongs to an old lady who happens to a believer. So she knows that she, she's not going to help a system, an oppressive system like as Muawiyah's. So no matter how much money they offer, she decides not to sell her house. 
So for the sake of publicity, they say, okay, we will build, you know, from the other side, we will not touch the house of this old lady. But they leave it at the same condition that it was then. So over time, the very first thing that happens to the houses which are old is that the roof collapses. When the roof collapses, you are left with the walls, and these walls are not steady, meaning that if you lean back against them, they may fall down. If you try to keep shelter under their shade, you are at the risk of the wall falling down on your head. This is why Imam Sajjad says they placed us in a wreckage in the Sham that would not protect us from the heat of the sun during the day and the cool and the breeze of the night at, at, at night time because they had to sit right in the middle of this wreckage of Sham during the day and right in the middle of it at night. No sense of protection. So in the middle of the night, the sound and the cry of a three-year-old goes up to the sky. In psychology, they say if you want to learn ikhlas, if you want to learn sincerity, look at a three-year-old, especially if it's a girl. If they want something, they want it completely. If they ask for something, they want it 100%. If they want water, all they think about is water. If they want food, all they think about is food, nothing else. Middle of the night, the shout of Lady Rogaya going to the sky. Oh, auntie, oh, auntie, where is my father? About 20 days has passed, she has not seen her father. Where is my father? You keep on telling me he has gone on a vacation. When is he coming back? Has he forgotten about me? How come he didn't take me with him? Lady Zainab, Salamullah alayha, I don't know how was she able to keep away Lady Ruqayya from the scene of the head of the shuhada all this way, but she keeps on telling her, you know, be patient, my dear one. Your father is alive. He has gone to, on a vacation. He will come back for you. Lady Ruqayya turns around and says, Oh, auntie, I know he will come back because I saw him in my dream. He had come to my dream. He was telling me, Ta'al. He was telling me, Ta'al, my little one, come to me. He was telling me, come to me and, and haste and haste and make sure you come to me faster. That's why I woke up, but I look around, I could not find my father. Where is my father? Where is Abu Abdullah? The women and children all of them started to cry. For so long, they did not have the choice to cry and mourn for Imam al Hussein. So now everybody's mourning, everybody's commemorating, everybody's crying and everybody's shouting. The sound goes up that Mal'oon wakes up in the middle of the night in Dar al Imara. What's going on? It is a three-year-old of Imam al Hussein. She's asking for her father. That's easy. Just take the head to her. Just imagine the picture. Those mal'uns place the head of Abu Abdullah al Hussein on a tray and cover it with a piece of cloth as a covering. They bring it to the wreckage of Sham. That soldier hands the tray to a three-year-old of Abu Abdullah. First, she looks at the tray and she pulls back. She says, I did not ask for any food. I don't want any ta'am. I don't want food. I didn't ask for food. I'm asking for my father. That mal'un, according to the maghtal, he pushes the tray towards Lady Ruqayya in a way to embrace the tray and says, this is what you wanted. So now she easily and carefully removes the cloth from the beloved head of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Now beautiful, she reaches over with her tiny hands. I mean a three-year-old, how big of the hands? She cannot pick it up with one hand. Two hands reaches over, picks up the head of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Now you have to think, what has happened to this beloved head that a three-year-old daughter of him cannot recognize the face of the Imam? She looks at the head of Imam al Hussein and he says, Anta Abi, are you my father? Are you my Hussein? Are you Abu Abdullah? Then she starts to cry and with the tears she's wiping out the face of Imam al Hussein. And she starts talking to the beloved head of Imam al Hussein. Oh father, who has done this to you? Oh father, who has cut off your veins? Oh father, who has messed up with your lips and with your teeth? O oh, Father, who has made your beard covered in blood? O oh, Father, where is your Ammama? 
Oh Father, what has happened to your skin? Why is your skin burned a little bit? Oh Father, why so many hits on your head? Oh Father, why did you leave us alone? Who is going to take after us once you leave? Oh Father, don't leave us with this people. This guys, oh Father, you were not there. They were hitting us left and right. Oh Father, do you want me to show you what have they done to me? You want to show you know, you want me to show you what have they done to my back? As she's venting with Abu Abdullah and Hussein, they see all of a sudden the head of Imam Al Hussein on one side, Bibi Ruqayya on the other. They call in the Ghassala. They call in a woman to come and do the ghusl and kafan of Lady Ruqayya. They say as she was about to do the ghusl on Lady Ruqayya, all of a sudden she starts screaming, hitting herself on the head and saying, Ya Allah, what has happened to this child? Where is the mother? Where is the father? Who is in charge here? Lady Zainab comes up to her, says, what is it? What's going on? What's the problem? She says, what has happened? This is a three-year-old. What are these marks? What are these black marks? What are these black spots? What are these bruises? Was she had a specific type of sickness? She says, no, these are just all the bruises from the slashes and the hits of the army of Umar Saad and Ibn Ziyad all the way from Karbala to Kufa, from Kufa to Sham. How much of a three-year-old can take? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon wa sayalamu alladheena zalamu ayya man ghalabin yan ghalaboon Let's remember all of the past ones, marhumin, marhumad, the deceased ones, and all of those who have come down with sicknesses and problems and facing difficulties in their world. And let's recite the salam upon Abu Abdullah Hussein all together. Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah wa ala al-arwah al-lati halat bifanaik. Alaykum minni salamullah abadan ma baqeet wa baqiya al-laylu wa al-nahar wa la ja'alahu allahu akhir al-lahd minni ila ziyaratikum Assalamu ala al-Husayn wa ala Ali ibn al wa ala awlad al wa ala ashab al one more time Assalamu ala al-Husayn wa ala Ali ibn al-Husayn wa ala awlad al wa ala ashab al اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم العظم العظ الأجل الأكرم إلهي بحق محمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين وتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين يا الله 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 اللهم عجل لبليك الفرج والعافية والنصر واجعلنا من عوانه وأنصاره اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا واشف أمراضنا وارحم أمواتنا واجعل عاقبة الأمور خيرا Oh Allah, hasten the appearance of Imam of Time Put our name among his true companions and followers O oh Allah, accept this majalis from us and extend the rewards of this majalis to shahada and ulama and marajah and marhumin and marhumat. O oh Allah, provide complete shafa and cure to all of those who have come down with illnesses and sicknesses all over the world. 
O Allah, on the haqq of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, answer the hawa'ij of all of the mu'mineen and mu'minat. O Allah, O Allah, O Allah, put our name among the true azadar and mourners of Imam al Hussein and give us the tawfiq of his ziyarat in this life and his shafa'a in this life and the next. O Allah, protect our future generations and children. O Allah, put all of them on the line of the muhabbin of the Ahlul Bayt and the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. O Allah, place our life, the life of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, and place our death, the death of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. O Allah, O Allah, O Allah, do not take us from this world unless if you have become completely satisfied with all of our actions. Rahimallah man qara'a fatiha ma'as salawat.